As I was just saying, I'm so very grateful that Stefan and Philip are here to, to chat with us about what's going on over in Europe, specifically ne negotiating and navigating the whole registration, evaluation, authorization, and restriction of chemicals um, rules that have been placed on them in their country. And like we were saying, I do like to start off by getting to know the people we're gonna interview first. So, you know, maybe starting with the, um, father than son or son or father however you want to to work the story but i'd love to learn a little bit more about you guys how long you been tattooed and how you got into the supplies world okay okay i start tattooing with i think eight or something it's over 30 years now and um, then a few years later i started with a supply company because uh, i started um, to produce grips and other tools because you don't get it on the market over here so i design some stuff then i give it to companies to make uh, like 1000 or more pieces and all the stuff what i wasn't using in my studios i start to sell to other artists so i started my supply business yeah and um we finally started it 97 or something 96 96 just start, yeah. and uh, then we go, was going bigger and bigger so first we rented just two rooms and then we were going, going over to rent a whole a whole uh, warehouse and then we built our own over here so yeah that's my history before right. this yeah so uh, i've been tattooing for uh, 10 years now. Meanwhile, I'm more involved into the supply business. Uh, we are run uh, on a family base level. And as Stefan just mentioned, we have been growing over the years. Um, uh, we have, uh, getting bigger market shares, of course, also in the supply um, business. And um, I think the special thing about us is that we don't do not only have like the uh, trade uh, and uh, legal and um, also regulatory insight into uh, the tattoo uh, supply business, but we also have the practical experience of the products and know what we are selling. Yeah, that's such a uh, important piece is to not not just be selling to the industry, but being practitioners yourselves, knowing how to use them and, and how they affect your daily life. And I've always appreciated when I get to meet, especially uh, Stefan um, artists that are innovative and engineer um, their own tools, because uh, it's funny you said, um, well, you've been tattooing for over 30 years and you opened your supply business in 96. I was 16 at that time and got my first tattoo. <laughs> But back then you had to um, make all your machines, make all your needles, make your pigments. You know, there was very uh, few supply companies, right? Uh, tattoo artists had to know how to do a lot of these things, which is way different than today. So it's, a, it's really good to have people with that experience that knew how to make the tools, knew how to use the tools, supply them for us today. Because uh, Philip, I'm sure you know, like now in the last 10 years, <laughs> many of the the tattoo artists don't know how to do these things right you know they they've lost the ability to to make these tools and make these supplies so they're reliant on suppliers and manufacturers so it's important that our suppliers and our manufacturers have tattoo artists interests at heart now you you did touch on a little element um you know regulatory side and that again going back to tattoo artists who um, or suppliers who are tattooers who care about the tattoo industry, you guys are, you know, well aware of what's going on and have been dealing with uh, reach regulations. And I'd love to kind of get a little bit of a background on that and how it kind of initially started and then how it took place in the in the EU. So the reach law, which we do have um, meanwhile in Europe or in the EU as the uh, um, regulatory framework, is actually based um, on a 2008 um, guideline, uh, which was also issued by the uh, European government, uh, which was called RACEUP uh, 2008. And uh, this was not like a law on a EU-wide level as uh, you see REACH now, but it was more like, as I said, like a guideline for national laws uh, that being made uh, by the um, various uh, EU members 
um, and to be integrated into those laws. Uh, but uh, this RESA was actually uh, an optional thing. So some countries um, took it into their national laws, like uh, uh, in Germany, we have the uh, German II um, ink law, uh, which took a lot of parts of this. They also always um, uh, related uh, their decisions to the European guideline. Other countries did not really um, for force this through and didn't really care about uh, making national laws. Uh, but yeah, this all changed with the REACH law now. So yeah. back up. Okay. Like, like countries like Germany, they they took this regulation of this this yeah this old law and add something to it like special uh, country laws and um, so it makes a big monster out of it but it was really hard even in germany to control it because we have 16 states in germany and everybody won in a, in a little bit different way so you never know if you bring something on the market like inks on the market it also will fit in um Berlin. yeah so the interpretation wild to to put it mildly yeah, um, yeah, it sounds like um, in 2008, you said they submitted some or provided some guidelines, just uh, basic optional um, methods to regulate um, inks and products and such. But uh, because of the intermittent regulations throughout the states, even like in Germany, uh, there was so much um, 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 differentiation that it was tough to accommodate that's very similar in the united states with we have 50 states with with what with our tech with our practitioner rules um they are different almost every 50 states so or every state so it's very difficult but as these started to come out back in, in 2008 in uh, in germany in the eu um how how was it received by the industry what would what were tattoo artists saying about it and doing about it it didn't. It didn't affect uh, the tattoo artists so much. It more affect the supply companies because in the in the past, like of the old days, um, not the like if they took a sample in a tattoo studio, the tattoo artist was was not really um, liable. Yeah, they Responsible yeah, not really responsible. For it. So he, he don't get a fine or something. He just is not allowed to, to use this ink anymore. But um, they they find the importers like everybody produce in Germany or import into Germany. They get a fine or have to go in court, front of court or something. But um, yeah, they took like the the law came uh, 2009 and it took about three to four years till we get um, till we get all our our companies from wherever in the world to to match this law yeah so they they it took a while till they till they get all the the points in the law so we we don't get problems anymore or not so much problems to always get problems I think also now we have takes for years till we get close to the to the reach okay so in the in around 2008 there was these new guidelines that really didn't affect the tattoo artists it was just the supply companies but mm -hmm. you're saying that would inspectors or um i'm not sure what you guys call them there um those who do inspections or come in and, and find people they would come into tattoo shops and test your inks or test tattoo or inks? Yeah, the, it's mostly people like um, agents from the health department in the most uh, states in Germany. Um, it's a little bit different from state to state, but mostly it's uh, health department uh, agents. And they take, they just check your, your inks and then they take samples. Uh, what wow. they think, what could be a problem. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then the government labs, we have, uh, I think we have in Germany right now, 10 or 11 government labs. And um, yeah, they send the samples there. And if they find something, then um, the health department comes back to the supply companies or to the artists. 
because sometimes the art inspired the stuff outside of Germany or from outside of Europe, then they have um, also yeah. a problem. Yeah. Then they the importers. Correct. In the end, you can also say that uh, a lot of health departments knew already uh, where the supplies were sitting all over Europe. So they tended more to uh, pull the inks uh, for testing from the supply companies. So we saw that change, but still there were some health departments, if it was just like uh, small local ones, it just showed up into two studios and um, yeah, just confiscated or uh, pulled the inks there for testings. Wow. Oh, that's, uh, that's that's the reason, but the reach is different mm. yeah so yeah tell me about that because i know it, it kind of eventually evolved into reach which now does affect the tattoo artist because if uh, with the race up was like if they took the sample and like it was an open sample like where the artist already was using the ink then they have almost no chance in front of court to uh, go against the supply company because about you don't know what's in yeah so they always have to test um sealed bottles yeah but now it's different now they can take everything even the open ones because they can they can first go against the artists and then the artists artists have to prove that this ink what he is tattooing is comes really from the light companies where he got the invoice from mm -hmm. so um again just as i'm trying to share your message with american tattoo artists what uh, i'm hearing is that this initial guidelines turned into a regulation and and when did reach go into go when did it happen when did it come into law came into law in two, uh, 2022 and there was like a, a second level uh, which just was introduced at the beginning of this year uh, which you might have heard of it um, uh, was related to the blue and uh, green pigment um, because they already realized that uh, the market cannot adapt so quickly with the production of new tattoo inks with those two pigments so we actually had two phases with the law okay so, so in 2002, reach uh, first phase was um, uh, put into law, and now it allows um, your health departments or agents from your health departments to go in and test um, the tattoo ink that tattoo artists are using. And if a tattoo artist is using an ink that's outside of reach compliance, then they have to prove um, that it's not their fault, or they themselves can get in trouble. Correct. So they are also responsible uh, and uh, have to um, accept their uh, legal share of um, being compliant to the to the reach law as well. Mm -hmm. and and then, now shared on various yeah. parties. And I think that's um, I think when we had talked before, um, you all were saying that when the reach law was made law like when it became a law that tattoo artists really were like meh it's not a big deal because they were used to the guidelines that only affected suppliers but now reach affects the tattoo artists and um what what was the like i know that now there's like uh save the pigments um, european society of tattoo and pigment research that are trying to um dispute and work with this um, compliance laws but what um what, what did tattoos do when it first happened just kind of didn't think it would affect them or well there was a lot of disbelief in the beginning uh especially when the suppliers started to inform tattoo artists or their their customers um as it was intended by the law also um uh, and uh, as soon as the, the two suppliers uh, started to sell off inks, which they were not allowed to uh, be selling in, uh, since 2022, um, yeah, nobody really, everybody was confused, of course, uh, a lot of insecurity. And uh, when the REACH uh, law was finally introduced um, last year, yeah, there was a lot of anger, a lot of frustration, of course, uh, within the industry. Um, and nobody really knew in the beginning how to handle the situation, of course. Yeah, we see in our company here that uh, you have to understand they, they bought a lot of inks. So it's 
kind of money what they have in, the, in their studios and they have to throw away maybe i don't know most of the inks yeah because the ingredient they have ingredients was not allowed anymore mm-hmm. so that yeah. was a little bit of problem. yeah yeah um there was nothing on the market that's the next point there was not much ink on the market in the beginning of 22 so uh, they had to throw the inks away but they can't buy new ones yeah that's uh that would be very frustrating um yeah it was um there was an article that i had written uh writ read <laughs> by uh dr georgian syrup uh and it was called the chaotic nature of tattoo ink in the eu and he was saying that the reach compliant um regulations were not based off of empirical data in other words it was research done that was not applicable to tattooing and it created a set of guidelines and and basically created tattoo inks that tattoo artists don't like and has ingredients we don't know and trust and this also then caused exactly what you said now all the tattooers have to throw away all the ink they trust and use very small amounts of ink they don't trust and this caused a lot of as he said a criminalizing effect in other words tattoo artists were like i'm still going to use it you know i'm still going to use this tattoo ink and hopefully no one comes in and finds me um did you have you guys noticed um, that type of behavior or i mean not calling anyone out or or saying that uh, nothing specific to anybody but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you got some people you got to call uh yeah no i mean that's um you know that that's traditionally you know the tattoo artists were like oh i don't care i'll keep doing it anyway but if we want to be professional we want to have our clients trust us and we want to you know have a, a a nice studio that we can have health inspectors come in and feel confident i mean that then kind of uh makes us feel um i guess nervous and um uh, again um less confident in what we're doing how, what was the you know being that you you two are tattoo artists as well what was the 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 feeling with tattoo artists around that well there might be might have been cases about the alibi inks uh, they were using you know for um just buying new compliance and still using the old ones uh, we actually really don't know uh, any specific cases, but it was rumors all about the industry. So you can assume that this was happening, to be honest. Um, but yeah, I mean, as you just mentioned, um, the, the problem in the beginning was, of course, with those inks also, that um, the criminal, uh, criminalization um, effect was there. So nobody really was sure what to use and how to use, and maybe did use stuff they weren't actually supposed to be using anymore. Um, but yeah, the, the big question is where we actually, why we came to that point with the reach law, because, um, what we think is the REACH law is seen as uh, that big thing that just was uh, pushed uh, through by the EU government uh, and we couldn't do anything about it. But that's actually not 100% true, to be honest. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if you also uh, uh, already got information about, uh, and we actually just learned this, I think, three years ago in Amsterdam at the World mm-hmm. Congress of the Two Pigments. Um, and we actually learned it from a um, course, uh, from the head of the um, of the legal um, task force of the EU Cosmetic uh, Association, and um, they actually told us that um, first of all, Reach Law didn't just show up in 2022, and it was there, and they just made it within a, within a few months. It actually took years to form this appendix of the of the Reach Law, basically, because the Reach Law is just like the um, chemical law of the European Union. And uh, within this time frame, we actually were also invited, as they told us, to be part of um, of, of the team um, that is actually um, negotiating about the uh, framework of this law. And the problem is um, nobody really from the tattoo industry, as we learned it, really showed up because we did not have like an umbrella organization consisting of national associations. 
um, as they have in other industries, like the cosmetics industry. So there was not really a lobby lobbying for our interests. Oh, that's uh, I mean that's that's good information to share because you know many don't pay attention until like you said it happens and then it's frustrating like what happened how this happen but we know all of us know here that to make a law takes a long time i mean there's a lot of pieces that have to happen to make that law and government uh i don't particularly always look at government as evil i just look at them as overworked understaffed and typically not knowledgeable enough but they do open a door at times to allow um input and it's on us as the professionals to be aware when we can have our input shared and i think that's the the big difference between reach in the eu and mokra in the us is uh, we do have a trade organization uh, the alliance of professional tattooists and uh you know i was connected to you both through Brian Everett who's been a member of the alliance for many many years and although it has been um you know very popular sometimes and not it's very strong and we do have the ability now to communicate to our government about um mokra which is like the eu's reach and our uh our fda our our government our, our um head of fda which is the um the task force the head of the task force for mokra went to this last uh worldwide uh, world conference of tattoo and pigment research in vienna and did discover a lot of the things you're sharing with me now that many of the tattoo artists weren't aware they um weren't happy with the new inks um that uh apparently there has been some recalls of some of the reach compliant pigments in Germany in your country as well and it has made them um concerned that we don't that the US does not want to adopt reach ourselves that they want to get input from our organization and i think that's important um because if we can give them good information and help improve um our regulations here and us having this conversation and building uh bridges between our countries that then we can then share what we've been doing too and potentially at least um next time or or when there's an opportunity to share industry input we can collaborate and share that information with uh, your governments as well and maybe improve some of the situation um and make tattoo artists more knowledgeable so that way they can be more active um so this doesn't happen again with other things right <clears throat> um i think I, that's I, just what's I think that? that's just i think that's just the beginning with the reach yeah. that is one more yeah yeah it is really to form uh on and streamline focus uh and hire experts uh which can really speak for, uh, in your case for the industry because to be honest we missed our chance for this and you are still at the point we can do this so mm-hmm. also um what's probably important for this as well is um getting new members uh for the association so every individual that two artists should join um and help um yeah investing and uh, financing uh, this lobbying work um to make it bigger this is in the end helps i mean you have to build from the base to the top somebody has to streamline it on the top but the base will finance this and this is pretty much an investment for every tattoo artist in their profession mm-hmm. yeah no i i appreciate you saying that because it's um again from two no uh individuals you two who are you step on with your years of experience and uh fill up with your you know growing up in that realm seeing from the top down from regulations and supplies and the tattoo um world and industry and practitioners that it's um advice and important to invest in our organization uh invest in uh, our industry by joining organizations that can uh, protect us in our future because i'm sure um you know it's amazing Uh, I don't know if my son's going to be a tattoo artist, 
but you know who knows maybe uh, uh philip you may have a son or a daughter one day that becomes a tattoo artist and you want to see it protected and um, safeguarded for future generations and and that's i think the work that we're doing today is to protect tattooing for you know beyond us nice. right for for the next um maybe not in our lifetime but for those ahead and um you guys taking the time to share this information with me which would then be shared with the tattoo artists in america and the us and everywhere else too that i communicate with and we communicate with i think will be invaluable and eye-opening for uh tattoo artists to realize that they do have the power right they do have the ability to do something and just getting mad and yelling and and saying you know bad stuff and and not complying is not a way that works anymore and that um through through joining our organizations and uh cooperating together and investing in our industry we can protect tattooing for our future generations and and again um work together i like the idea of um you know us uh working with the eu and and you know us collaborating to try and help each other um, for the tattoo industry as a whole so uh i i do appreciate you guys' time i don't want to take up too much more of it i'm sure you got uh, you got a busy rest of your day is there any final thoughts or or um or anything you want to say before we wrap up for the for the interview not really no it's just what we just mentioned so as as you also uh put it um the the government is not the the big organ a big evil in organization which is trying to do uh and harm us they are just there for customer protection and i mean the tattoo industry is growing which is beneficial to all of us in our industry uh but this means also new responsibilities which we have to face uh and work with and as you said it and i think uh, and we think the same thing it is in general it is a good thing but it's, it is also a lot of work um and um commitment we have to put into that thing well said yes yeah very well said i appreciate that and uh you know i uh, i wish you to uh much luck with what's going on now and i definitely want to keep um in touch and share uh information and continue to work together to protect our our industry and our craft